chasing us up here. And Facebook, there was, they said there was killer clowns around here that were killing people. And I've come up with a concept by myself. It's the Crockett Eagle. And I'm thinking, he's supposed to be jumping up and down on the other end of the phone. We're supposed to be able to get the line and pull people. Just here, you know, you know. He's made the conscious decision not to talk a truly bizarre story. Hello and welcome back to the second to last tier on the infamous hoaxes iceberg. We are almost to the bottom of this damn thing and my god it has taken us a while. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Emily and on this channel I make videos and documentaries on all things strange, usually taking a deep dive into fringe history and bizarre stories. These videos are a little bit less of a deep dive and more of a cursory look, but I hope that you'll learn something weird nonetheless. We're getting into the lesser known hoaxes now and surprisingly I haven't heard of many of these entries but we are in for a wild ride some of these are absolutely bonkers so with that being said let's get on with it shall we this series is brought to you by viewer support on patreon you can sign up for as little as one pound a month which gives you early access to videos and helps to fund the research and creation of these documentaries go to the link in the description or the pinned comment and sign up today <laughs> In the early 2000s, a company called Aerotech Industries launched a website to promote their incredibly bizarre creation. They called it the Love Lump, and they claimed that it was a collection of living tissues and organs that had been artificially engineered. To be frank with you, it's a pair of boobs and both male and female genitalia all put together in one lump. I wish I could show you a photograph, but unfortunately the powers that be at YouTube would demonetize this video in a goddamn instant, because apparently we're not all adults here. The love lump was a supposed self-gratification toy for sickos who wanted to get off with something that looks straight out of the shunting scene in the movie Society. If you have any edible fantasies you'd like to indulge in, Billy, now's the time. As you've probably worked out by now, the love lump never existed. It was the creation of an artist named Henry Ross who claimed to have created the website as a reaction to developments within the biotech industry. So if you were getting excited at the prospect of being able to order one of these things, and I'm sorry to crush your sicko dreams. On the 17th of May 1991, TV audiences in Russia bore witness to a bizarre and almost unbelievable broadcast. It was a long-form interview with a man named Sergei Kurikin, who claimed to have some shocking and profoundly earth-shattering revelations about Vladimir Lenin. The programme began with a short introduction, with the host announcing a new segment that would introduce new approaches to well-known historical events in both the Soviet Union and the rest of the world. This first edition would address what the host called the mystery of the October Revolution, and audiences were definitely not prepared for the strange twists and turns that this story was about to take. Sergei claimed that his investigations had led him to Mexico, where he'd seen mural paintings depicting a scene similar to the October Revolution. He'd read Carlos Castaneda's work and researched the psychedelic effects of cactuses and mushrooms, specifically peyote, which he refers to by its Latin name. Его латинское название Лофофора Вильямси. Вот. Он содержит в себе некоторые галлюциногенные препараты, которые вызывают сильнейшие галлюцинации, и благодаря которым человек может увидеть совершенно невероятные картины, очень рельефно и красочно. Это картины, как правило, очень массовые. He then points us towards a strange object on Lenin's desk. Вот фотография Ленина в его рабочем кабинете. Посмотрите сюда. Видите, никто из исследователей не обращал внимания на тот странный предмет, который находится у него рядом с чернильницей. Вот он. Видите, сверху у него такая верхушка. Напоминает нам маленькую летающую тарелку. Ну, грубо говоря, в общем, да. He claims that this strange object resembles Tabinicarpus, a cactus that he claims produces psychotropic effects. The strange broadcast continued with Sergei telling the host that he'd read through Lenin's letters and had found one that contained the sentence, Yesterday I ate too many mushrooms, but I felt great. Of course, we're not talking about oyster mushrooms or portobellos. We're talking about 
rather trippy kind. Sergei claims that because of these shrooms, Lenin had seen the October Revolution before it happened. Things take an even stranger turn when he tells the host that during a visit to MIT, he discovered that mushrooms possess the same acoustic properties as a radio wave. То есть грипп, в общем-то, если говорить так грубо, если чтобы понятно языке, грипп это радиоволна. It doesn't end there, my friends. He then says that if a person takes these mushrooms for an extended period, they become his personality. He says that people slowly turn into literal mushrooms and then, ultimately, into a radio wave, which leads him to his most shocking revelation. И сейчас я вам скажу то, что самое главное, к чему я все это веду. О том, что у меня есть совершенно непровержимые доказательства, что вся... Октябрьская революция делалась с людьми, которые много лет потребляли соответствующие грибы. И грибы в процессе того, как они были потребляемы этими людьми, вытесняли в этих людях их личность, и люди становились грибами. То есть я просто-напросто хочу сказать, что Ленин был грибом. Грибом, более того, он был не только грибом, он был еще, помимо всего, радиоволной. Now, obviously, we all know that the October Revolution was not the brainchild of a bunch of hippies strung out on psychedelics and was instead a working-class uprising against autocratic rule. And it's hard to believe that anyone watching this interview would have actually believed it. But the timing of this hoax was important. Alexei Yerchak writes in his essay, A Parasite from Out of Space, that a programme of this kind could only have been successful during the limited historical window of the early 1990s. Earlier, the media was too tightly controlled by the Soviet party state. Television programmes had to be pre-approved and any irony at the expense of the political foundations would have been impossible. Later, in the post-Soviet 1990s, although irony about the Soviet system had become common, the media ultimately fell under new forms of control, the new political system and its newly introduced market considerations. According to the same essay, the TV studio was overwhelmed with phone calls demanding an explanation. Could it be that Lenin was actually a mushroom? You know, Lenin. Was this just a prank? Lenin, did anyone ever hear of Lenin? As we've come to discover through the course of this series, the response to these kinds of hoaxes are often exaggerated, so it becomes incredibly hard to ascertain exactly what the public thought at the time. Yerchak goes on to write that the host of the show had unimaginable freedom when it came to choosing topics. He says that this free indeterminacy, which cannot even be imagined on television today, ended in the mid-1990s with the privatisation of television and the emergence of strict programming formats. I'd highly recommend going to read that essay. I'll leave it linked down below because it provides a lot more historical context and also some interesting information about Sergei Kurikin himself, most specifically his later support for Alexander Dugin. But that's the can of worms that I shan't be opening in this video, so let's move on. Do you ever read the reviews of a film critic and think to yourself, what the hell is wrong with this person? Why do they have no taste whatsoever? And how the hell did they get this job in the first place? That seemed to be the internal monologue of a journalist for Newsweek named John Horn, who, in early 2001, decided to investigate a film critic who went by the name of David Manning. Manning seemed to work for the Ridgefield Press, and he was fond of giving positive reviews to movies released by Columbia Pictures, owned by parent company. Sony Pictures Entertainment. He gave a glittering review to Rob Schneider's The Animal, saying that the producing team of Big Daddy has delivered another winner, along with proclaiming that Hollow Man was one hell of a scary ride, alongside The Forsaken, which was a scary, sexy thrill ride. But what was it about David Manning that caught the attention of a Newsweek journalist? Well, it was the small problem of him uh, not existing. Apparently, Horn's interest in David Manning and whether or not he was a real film critic had been piqued when he discovered that Manning had released his positive review of The Animal before the movie had actually been screened to critics. So he either had the gift of second sight or something dodgy was going on. Through the course of his investigation, Horn discovered that nobody called David Manning worked for the Ridgefield Press. So he decided to go directly to Sony and ask them whether or not Manning existed. I was more puzzled than anything because I couldn't yet imagine he was a fake. Then I called Sony. Before the studio returned my call, I got a call from the producer of The Animal and he said he had nothing to do with David Manning. That made me even more curious. 
So I asked Sony specifically if Manning existed, and the studio said no. It turns out that Manning was the creation of Matthew Kramer, who at the time was the director of creative advertising at Sony. He'd used the name of his real-life friend David Manning, who would later say that he didn't think anything of it, and that he was somewhat excited about seeing his name in a newspaper. Ultimately, Sony ended up paying a $326,000 fine for their use of fake reviews to promote their movies. Which, let's be frank, is a mere drop in the ocean for a company like that. According to the Museum of Hoaxes, this next entry was the first internet hoax to reach a mass audience. It originated via email, and in the early 90s, chain email hoaxes were all the rage. This one claimed to be a legitimate news article from the Associated Press. Its title was Microsoft Bids to Acquire the Catholic Church. It claimed that there had been a joint press conference in St. Peter's Square, where both Microsoft and the Vatican had announced that the software giant will acquire the Catholic Church in exchange for shares in Microsoft's stock. It was to be the first time a tech company had acquired a world religion. And nowadays, the tech companies feel a little like religions themselves, but that's off topic. They also claimed that you can get communion, confess your sins, receive absolution, even reduce your time in purgatory, all without leaving your home via their new application, Microsoft Church. It was a very obvious hoax, but Microsoft felt the need to respond, releasing their own press release denying the story and apologising to anyone that may have been offended. According to the Museum of Hoaxes, some people did actually believe it. Which shouldn't surprise me, but alas, here I am, constantly taken aback by people who will literally believe in anything. <laughs> If, like me, you're a bit of a folklore connoisseur, then you may have heard the name Lucy Lightfoot before. She was a young girl who supposedly disappeared on the 13th of June, 1831, during a violent thunderstorm in the village of Gatcom on the Isle of Wight. The story goes, on the same day, there was also a total eclipse of the sun. There was a lot of weather going on. I bet it was the talk of the town. To shield herself from the storm, she'd taken shelter in the local St. Olive's church, which had been built for the Esther family in 1292 and Lucy was apparently very familiar with it. She had allegedly become obsessed with the wooden effigy of Sir Edward Esther, spending hours fantasising at its side, supposedly dreaming of wild romantic adventures with him. Quite the imagination. After the weather had calmed, people began to search for Lucy but all they found was her horse tied up to the gate of the church. She disappeared never to be seen again. According to the story, her parents had offered a substantial reward for any information leading to her being found, but there was nothing. The only strange thing discovered in the church was the supposed shattered steel dagger that the effigy had been holding. It wasn't until 1865 that clues began to appear, thanks to the research of Reverend Samuel Trelawney, who, via his research into the Crusades, had allegedly found a manuscript that referenced a certain Sir Edward Esther, along with his romantic partner, a brave woman called Lucy, from the Isle of Wight. This led to some strange theories, including that of a time kink that could have been accentuated by the unique weather conditions, as well as Lucy's longing to be with the adventurous Esther. So it's a tale of freak storms, a disappearing girl and potential time travel, and it's also completely fictional. I'm sorry to burst the romantic fantasy of it all, but this is called the hoax's iceberg for God's sake. You should have known it would be a hoax. It was the creation of a man named James Evans, who was the vicar of the church. He was described as a talented speaker and a great storyteller that extended a cheerful and genuine friendship to all in the village. It's said that he dreamed up the story of Lucy Lightfoot in the 60s to try and raise money for the church and raise its profile. But the story soon took on a life of its own amongst paranormal enthusiasts and people who just enjoyed a good yarn. And the village of Gatcombe still has visitors looking for Lucy to this day. I'm not 
one of these people that gets easily scared by clowns. The one exception to that is probably Tim Curry's Pennywise. And I know it's an incredibly camp performance, but there's just something about it, man. It scares the living hell out of me. However, I can say that if I was pottering around outside in 2016, minding my own business, and suddenly stumbled upon someone dressed as an evil clown, I'd probably be terrified. The initial creepy clown sightings began on August 1st and were supposedly part of a marketing stunt to promote a short horror film called Gags, starring none other than Gags the Clown. Creepy photographs of the character stalking the streets of Green Bay, Wisconsin appeared on social media and they created such a furore that the police were called, but they couldn't really do anything about a person wandering around in a clown costume. By the end of the month, the media had another creepy clown story on their hands, this time in Greenville County, South Carolina. The New York Times reported that a group of clowns were trying to lure children into the woods, even offering them money. Then, two weeks later, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, there were more bizarre stories of clowns trying to lure children into the woods. Well, the first sighting was here in this wooded area behind me off East 29th Street. The clown reportedly offering kids treats to lure them inside. There's woods right over here. You don't, we don't even want our kids to come outside anymore. It started in South Carolina and now it's up here. That's, that's nerve wracking. Around the same time in nearby Greensboro, a man claimed to have seen a clown coming out of the woods and decided to chase it with a machete. Christopher Bass says he chased the clown into these woods after spotting it from his deck. I had my firearm, my book bag and a machete in my hand. Instinct. I got kids. While his wife called 911. He was there with his machete, trying to see if he could catch him. Bass says it was instinctive. He's heard about Sunday's incidents in Winston-Salem and recent sightings in South Carolina. It's just scary to see him back here. Real scary, but I knew it was coming. Winston, right here. These clowns are getting around, man. They're bloody everywhere. We do know that it's striking fear uh, uh, among members of our public, and so uh, we have patrols out in each of these areas and wherever we think we might anticipate that person. We've added patrols to see if we can intercept uh, the person and the activity. As well as striking fear among the general public, working clowns were bloody terrified too. This is my life, this is my family, you know, and I know a lot of clowns that do this for a living and, and it's been hard. Imagine you're just clocking off an arduous eight hour shift clowning, walking home after a hard day's work, and suddenly you got someone chasing you with a fucking machete. There were all manner of strange reports, and it's difficult to ascertain what was real and what was hysteria or people just having a laugh. On September 14th, two people were arrested in LaGrange, Georgia, for calling the police with a fake clown sighting. In Kentucky, this young man was arrested for trying to scare people in a ditch. Police have arrested at least 12 people across the United States for participating in menacing stunts or making false reports. And a middle school in the same city was placed on a lockdown after being threatened by clowns on social media. The next day, another school was put on lockdown, this time at Flomerton High School in Alabama after again being threatened by clowns on Facebook. Everybody was kind of freaking out. But they didn't know if it was like a joke or not or if this was serious and someone, someone clown was out here at school. No clown was ever spotted on or near campus. Students proud of the quick action by law enforcement. It's not a joke to sit there and threat the school and threat kids and that we take it really seriously around here. One of the people involved was actually charged with making a terrorist threat on social media. Students at universities were involved in clown hunts, which is exactly what you think it is. At Penn State, hundreds of students flooded the streets in search of clowns that had allegedly been seen around campus, though police reported that there were no credible sightings or threats. No matter who you're voting for, we can all agree on one thing. What is Fuck that? That? Things got even more ridiculous when the media picked up on the claims that there was going to be a killer clown purge on Halloween. A threat was posted on social media claiming that clowns are going to purge cities across the country on Halloween Eve. Posted on social media claiming clowns were going to purge cities across the country on Halloween Eve. And on that list is Greenville, South Carolina. Greenville police say it's not credible, but they say you should still be vigilant. 
But many parents are saying they're not even going to take their kids trick-or-treating because of the reports of clowns already trying to lure kids into the woods. Just last week, Target pulled clown masks from its stores, and McDonald's announced that Ronald McDonald will be making fewer appearances because of the quote-unquote creepy clown climate. The 2016 clown sightings have been chalked up to mass hysteria, but it's important to remember that there were actually people dressed as clowns running around trying to scare people. If you were a parent and suddenly the news starts churning out headlines about clowns trying to lure children into the woods, along with photographs of people dressed up in slightly unnerving costumes, armed with weapons, then of course you're gonna be concerned. I have a four-year-old granddaughter that I'm raising and she loves candy, she loves clowns, she loves all colorful things. So if that would have been her going in there and I wouldn't have been able to find my baby, that's that's heartbreaking for a child, for a parent to lose their child. I've lost one. I don't plan on losing another. So while these sightings may have been mostly hoaxes, they created a fear that was incredibly real for the people whose communities were supposedly being overrun by creepy killer clowns. On June 1st, 2007, one of the most shocking and controversial reality TV shows was broadcast in the Netherlands. Its name was The Great Donor Show, and the concept was simple. A 37-year-old terminally ill woman had decided to donate one of her kidneys, and 25 people were to compete to be the lucky recipient. 22 of the so-called participants were eliminated in the first round, leaving three potential candidates to battle it out, with viewers texting in from home to to share their opinions on who should win the prized organ. If you thought reality TV in 2007 was already scraping the bottom of the barrel, then this show proved that beyond that barrel was another barrel to be scraped. It was produced by Endemol, the company behind such hits as Big Brother, and it was decried as exploitative and the dregs of broadcasting. This television show is exploiting people's desperation and it's, it's a tragedy. You know, Ziggur, the one thing that worries me about the message being sent here is that it does cheapen the human body and treat it as entertainment to sell a desperately needed organ to someone uh, who might die right. otherwise. Is that the message right. you want to be sending? Well, it might be a tactless show, but if people agree to go on it and are fully informed, then it's their decision. But it wasn't actually real. The programme had been inspired by the founder of BNN, the network who had broadcast the show. His name was Bart de Graff, and he had been a recipient of a donated kidney in 1997. The aim of the great donor show was to shed light on the shortage of potential organ donors in the Netherlands. The terminally ill woman was an actor. The participants were real kidney patients, but they were aware that the entire thing was a publicity stunt for a worthwhile cause. We had the commercials, we had the flyers, we had the posters. It doesn't help. So something very drastic was needed, and this had to happen to wake up everybody. There we go. It's, it's just the way it is. I thought it was brilliant, really. And I really thought, I know the transplantation doctors, and I, I thought they'll never go and do it, actually do it. But it's good for the publicity, and um, there are no losers, and they would not have been losers anyway because of all the attention we have for our problem now. What wonderful. The, we, we need this uh, publicity, and uh, it's a real good ending because I didn't like the idea that she has to choose between uh, candidates, so uh, wonderful that they use an actor. Yeah, wonderful, great. The show went on to win the 2008 International Emmy for Non-Scripted Entertainment. And we want to dedicate this prize to all the people on the waiting list who were waiting for donor transplantation. And that's what it was all about. And I want to say to the Dutch government, please think again. We can change our donor system so all things will get better. So remember, dear people from the Dutch government, always look on the bright side of death. Thank you very much. I'm going to end this one on a happy note and let you know that as of 2020, all three participants in the show that needed kidney transplants were still alive.
At the beginning of 2001, a disturbing website claiming to be dedicated to preserving the long-lost art of body modification in house pets began generating headline news. The website itself, bonsaikitten.com, claimed to offer its visitors the animal complement to the bonsai tree. They wrote that it's not possible to trim a kitten, but by physically constraining the growth of a developing living thing, it can be directed to take the shape of the vessel that constrains it. Nasty stuff, right? It gets a little worse when you navigate to their method page where they claim that kittens' bones are capable of being gently warped and that they can be molded to almost any shape in their formative years, thus leaving you with a kitten in whatever shape you want. Probably the most disturbing page of all is the one with the images that I won't show here. But to be clear, there is no evidence that any animals were actually harmed. The website gained prominence via protest chain emails. They circulated the website and asked people to sign a petition to get it taken down. Eventually, the FBI got involved and it was discovered that the website belonged to MIT graduate Dr. Michael Wong Chang, who claimed to have started the site as a joke. It was also hosted on the MIT servers via his on-campus laptop before later being moved to the Rotten.com servers. MIT's network manager, a man named Jeff Jeffrey Schiller claimed that the photographs were an illusion, that the jars were actually bigger than the kittens photographed, and they could walk into the jar and out of it. Either way, the website infuriated animal activists, and I can see why. The fact that the website eventually was hosted by Rotten.com speaks for itself. Wong Chang would later say that the dichotomy between exploiting distasteful subject matter in the guise of information and exploiting it as entertainment is artificial and hypocritical. Critical. And that's all well and good. But when you put photographs of animals being squished into glass jars on the internet, don't be surprised when the animal activists come for your neck. Here we have another strange and disturbing story from 2001 that gained traction via outraged chain emails. If you were unlucky enough to receive one of these and open the attached images, you'd be greeted with what appeared to be a man feasting on the roasted carcass of what appeared to be a baby. But fret not, what you're looking at is actually a conceptual art piece created by the Chinese performance artist Zhu Yu. The project was called Eating People and it debuted at an art festival in Shanghai in 2000. The photographs were so convincing that apparently authorities in both the UK and the US investigated them, trying to figure out whether or not they were actually looking at a crime, but they soon discovered that it was merely a shocking work of art. The images went viral again at the beginning of the pandemic, fueled by racism and a wave of anti-Chinese rhetoric. While controversial and somewhat grotesque to look at, the images are completely fake and no babies were harmed in their creation. Let's move on to something a little less intense, shall we, eh? To fully understand the 1984 video game Hairraiser, we need to first understand a 1979 picture book written by Kit Williams. It was called Masquerade and it followed Jack Hare as he's tasked to carry treasure from the moon to the sun, but along the way he loses it, thus sparking the beginning of the reader's own journey. If you'd picked up a copy, then you were encouraged to look for the treasure yourself. Kit Williams had actually created an 18 karat golden hair and he he'd buried it somewhere in England. But we printed 60,000 copies, which for an unknown book by an unknown artist is pretty amazing. And what happened, it went mad, completely crazy. We thought we were bound to have enough till Christmas. And we reprinted a further 50,000 the day after publication, and three days later, yet another 50,000. I've really never seen a book like it. This is today's mail. Just a few letters here, plus this special express delivery from a man who writes to me every week in America. This package has got today's American letters in it. I mean, this is this has been going on like this for so long, every single day. I might say it's very boring. As you can see, this book was insanely popular, most likely because it was so maddening. People couldn't figure out where the hell this golden hair was buried. Well, that was until Ken Thomas wrote a letter to Kit Williams in 1982. It soon became clear that the enormously complicated puzzle set by Kit Williams had been solved by an enormously complicated man. 
For a start, we still don't know his real name. All he will give is a pseudonym. Ken Thomas. He was a very secretive character, interviewed for the BBC behind a sheet of glass and presumably his voice had been disguised, which makes you wonder why. But that will be revealed in a moment. For now, Ken Thomas discovered the location, wrote a letter to Williams and then together they dug up the treasure. As far as anyone knows, Ken Thomas is the legitimate winner of the Golden Hair. But what about this video game? Lovingly dubbed the worst game of all time, it was split into two parts, Hair Razor Prelude and Hair Razor Finale, and was released in summer 1984, just two years after Thomas had supposedly solved Masquerade for the price of £8.95. In comparison, this game would be around 35 to 40 quid today, so people were expecting something worth the money. The goal of the game much like Masquerade before it, was to find the hair inside the game via a puzzle of graphics and text. If you solved it, the prize was either the golden hair itself or £30,000 in cash. This game flopped hard. They were accused of just trying to make more money by releasing it in two parts, as well as making it quite literally impossible to solve. The bad reviews and the heavy price tag saw the game sell terribly, and eventually the company that produced them, Hairsoft, went into liquidation. The entire thing appeared to be a scam. If nobody could actually solve the game, then nobody could get their grubby mitts on either the golden hair or the £30,000. But who could possibly have been behind such a crass scheme? It wasn't until 1988 that the truth was finally revealed, mostly thanks to Frank Branston at the Bedfordshire on Sunday newspaper. He discovered that the man behind Hairsoft was named Doug Old Thompson, and Doug Old Thompson was actually the mysterious Ken Thomas who had found the golden hair in 1982. But he hadn't found it by sheer wit. He'd been helped along somewhat unwillingly by a man named John Gard, who just so happened to be dating Kit Williams's ex, Veronica Robertson. They appeared to be close, with Thompson serving as the director of Gard's company, Clayprint. And according to the testimony of a metal detector expert named Eric Compton, John Gard knew where the hair was buried and he'd been out to dig for it. At some point, Thompson discovered the location in which they were digging, fired off a letter to Kit Williams announcing that he'd found the general location, Kit accompanies to dig at that exact spot and awards him with the golden hair. Then, two years later, Thompson attempts to capitalise on owning this golden hair by creating the most convoluted, dull and unsolvable video game of all time, ensuring that nobody would ever actually win so he'd never have to part with his beloved hair or the £30,000. But karma comes for us all in the end. Hairsoft was eventually liquidated and the golden hair itself was sold at Sotheby's by the creditors for a whopping £32,000 in 1988. In 2009, Kit Williams was finally reunited with it. Well, that's it. What a nice thing to see again. I thought I'd never ever see that again. I just haven't seen it, I haven't, I haven't touched it. I'd... It's very emotional, really. In a way, it was like an apprentice piece. I, I made it because I was almost no one going, going nowhere. And then I made this thinking, this is something really special. And it, and it turned out that way. And I'm, I'm a little bit overwhelmed by it to see it again. Which I think is a lovely way to end this strange tale. <laughs> These kind of hoaxes that declare a certain day to be gravityless seem to come around relatively often. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to focus on a BBC hoax from 1976 involving the British astronomer Sir Patrick Moore. Designed to be a send-up of the book The Jupiter Effect, which posited that a grand planetary alignment would create environmental catastrophes in the year 1982, Moore announced on the radio on April Fool's Day that Pluto was going to pass by behind Jupiter and people on Earth would feel a noticeable decrease in gravity. He claimed that if you were to jump into the air at 9.47am, 
then you'd feel yourself floating. It wouldn't be a complete lack of gravity, but you'd definitely feel a bit off. Apparently, people called in to the radio station to claim that they had actually felt the effects of what Moore had called the Jovian Plutonian gravitational effect, with one woman claiming that her and her friends had floated around the room. The name given to the hoax was a clear reference to the Jupiter effect, which would later go on to be disowned by its writers, with one of them saying that he was sorry that he ever had anything to do with it. Moore's hoax has been repurposed multiple times since 1976, with some chump popping up on social media on an almost yearly basis to declare that zero gravity day is incoming. And you can guarantee that a handful of people fall for it every single time. In late 1726, a strange story appeared in Mist's Weekly Journal in England concerning a woman who had allegedly given birth to something incredibly bizarre. The woman in question was Mary Toft. She was an English peasant and had been forced to continue manual work during a pregnancy, ultimately leading to a miscarriage. The next month, she went into labour again, but this time she was giving birth to what appeared to be parts of animals. This was supposedly witnessed by some of her neighbours and none of them knew what to think. Here was this seemingly normal woman, suddenly churning out all sorts of oddities. There were three legs of a cat of a tabby colour, one leg of a rabbit, the guts of a cat and three pieces of the backbone of an eel. It's the kind of story that sounds like it should be directed by Larry Cohen. There's only one thing wrong with the Davis baby. It's alive. I can see it now. It's alive for. The only thing wrong with the toft baby is it is made of animal parts. In 1700s England, people believed that something supernatural was happening. I mean, it's not every day that you watch a woman give birth to all that. The story began to spread and it reached the most wretched people on this godforsaken island, the British royal family. And King George I became weirdly obsessed with the case. They ended up sending the secretary to the Prince of Wales to observe Mary Toft himself and he conveniently saw her give birth to a dead rabbit but why on earth was any of this happening the explanation given at the time was something called maternal impression it was the belief that the inner workings of the mind as well as life events could have a profound impact on an unborn fetus some examples of this are birthmarks on a child being shaped like the food the mother was craving at the time it's a long discredited theory but back then it was all the rage and Mary Toft claimed that she had been frightened by a rabbit while working which had somehow led to her giving birth to a bunch of rabbits and other assorted animal bits or did she? Of course she didn't. This is the hoax's iceberg, for God's sake. How many times do I have to keep telling you? The real story emerged in December 1726 when it was discovered that Mary's husband had been buying up rabbits and that Mary's sister-in-law, Margaret, had approached a porter and asked him to find her a rabbit and sneak it into Mary's bedroom. The porter ended up spilling the beans and midwife James Douglas began to grill Mary on what the hell was going on. After being threatened with an intrusive surgery, she finally confessed, three times no less over the course of several days. She blamed multiple people for the hoax, most notably her husband's family. And this is where it gets really quite disturbing. She said that the animal parts were actually put inside her post miscarriage and she had essentially simulated giving birth to them. It's also noted that she gave birth to these animals while some of them had claws intact. Mary was accused of being an abominable cheat and imposter pretending to deliver several monstrous births and she got banged up at Bridewell Prison for four months before being released. She went on to have a human daughter and pretty much disappeared from the public eye but in more recent years the story has been re-examined. Just how much agency did Mary have in this whole charade? In her article on Mary Toft, writer and journalist Sabrina Imbler interviewed both Karen Harvey, a historian at the University of Birmingham, and Nikki Russell from the University of Glasgow. Harvey said that Toft was a young, extremely poor woman from a small town who was taken to London, all the time escorted and watched by titled, landed, aristocratic men. I think she was just playing the lead role in a performance orchestrated by other people. And Russell noted that it could have been seen as a way out of grinding poverty 
or a desire just to be noticed or important for a short while. But she seemed completely overwhelmed and scared, fearful of what would happen to her for making fools out of so many prominent people in society. The 2002 Atlantic hurricane season took 50 lives and caused $2.4 billion worth of damage. And it also gave us our next hoax on the list. We're very concerned about tornadoes, tornado watches. Hurricane Lily was the strongest hurricane of the season when it came to wind speed. It had weakened significantly before making landfall in Louisiana. And at this point, you might be wondering why it's included in this video at all. Well, let me explain. Shortly after the hurricane, this photograph, which claimed to show three tornadic water spouts in the Gulf of Mexico began to be circulated via email. It looked like a scene straight out of the movie Twister. I'm surprised there weren't a floating cow in it as well. As you've probably guessed, the photograph was fake. It was actually an edited version of this original photograph, which appeared in a newsletter called Anchor Lines about a year earlier. However, it appears that triple tornadic water spouts do actually exist. Take this video, for example, which clearly shows them off the coast of Finland. But again, a distinct lack of floating cows. <laughs> I can see clearly now the rain is gone. This next entry is another fake website that appeared in February 2006 and was promoted via email. I cannot stress enough how big email was for these kind of hoaxes. And doing the research for these videos has made me like weirdly nostalgic for the days of chain emails. Make chain emails a thing again. Anyway, the website was called Lassic at Home and it promoted at home laser eye surgery. They claimed that it was the same surgical procedure that was performed at eye clinics around the world, but without the unnecessary equipment and staff. I don't know about you, but I feel like staff are quite necessary when it comes to pointing a laser at your eye, but that's just me. The website claimed that the company had been founded two years prior by Dr. Amir Kadim, a supposed pioneer in the field of laser eye surgery, who had performed over 2,000 procedures. The website even had testimonials from people who had supposedly performed their own laser eye surgery in just four easy steps. One of them being perform the painless procedure. They all claimed to be enjoying their new clear-sighted life, but it was clearly all bollocks. Whoever made the website has remained anonymous for all of these years, and I'm not sure if it was another art project or just someone having a laugh. And if you want a baseball cap or a tote bag promoting a relatively underwhelming mid-2000s internet hoax, then today is your lucky day because apparently they still sell merch. It's April Fool's Day 2009 and the wireless telecommunication company Qualcomm are about to unveil their extremely strange creations, or should I say abominations. The company wanted to expand their wireless coverage and had decided to do that by implanting what they called base stations inside pigeons. They wanted them to fly around and create a dynamic network, as you do. We then realized we needed to protect this better by splicing it with a wolf and that created the wolf pigeon. Wolves are self-defendable and form packs when needed, yet they go out as long wolves to areas where normally you wouldn't have coverage. There you have it, Qualcomm's wolf pigeon. But the fun didn't stop there because apparently there were some problems with the wolf pigeon. They can overpopulate and they can run amok and cause havoc amongst the human population itself. This is where the shark falcon comes into the picture basic objective of the shark falcon is that it keeps the wolf pigeon population under check. All right, so we've got a shark falcon too. Surely there can't be any more. Yeah, my name's Roland and I'm a junior engineer and I've come up with a concept by myself. It's the crocket eagle. Wolf pigeons, shark falcons and crocket eagles. That 
to me, is the Holy Trinity. Now, it's a very obvious hoax and nobody fell for it. It was just a joke. But the beginning part where they talk about implanting base stations and wireless devices inside of animals did get me thinking about some of the CIA's most bizarre projects involving animals. There was Operation Acoustic Kitty, which was a plan to put a microphone in a cat's ear canal along with a radio transmitter in its skull so it could spy on communists. The common story is that it never really worked and that the whole plan was abandoned. But that's disputed by some people that actually worked on the project. Although good luck getting any information about it because what wasn't destroyed in a fire is all completely classified. <laughs> Believe it or not, this one occurred on April Fool's Day. I know, I know, shocking. Back on April 1st, 2000, UK newspaper The Independent ran the following headline. Scientists develop wonder pill to boost libido of sexually inadequate pets. It was written by a journalist named John Walsh, and he claimed that a bunch of animal behaviour researchers in Florida had discovered that domestic pets suffer from sexual anxiety, just like humans do. The article claimed that the findings had been circulated by the Zevon research faculty. And as well as uncovering that pets like hamsters and guinea pigs were riddled with performance anxiety, they'd supposedly come up with a cure. They claimed to have created a pill called feral moan, Viagra for animals if you will, which you would grind up and mix in with your pet's food. And then boom, no more performance issues. Honestly, the things I have to look up for these videos, I hope nobody goes through my search history because I don't want to explain why I've been searching for Viagra for hamsters. Let's move on. This one is more of a legend or fable than a straight up hoax. It concerns a young woman who was allegedly elected to be Pope in the year 855. She supposedly held this position for two years, concealing herself as a man until in 858, she gave birth during a procession. The story of Pope Joan first appeared in the early 13th century in a chronicle of Metz, a city in Northern France, written by Jean de Maly. He writes about a female Pope who disguised herself as a man, gave birth and was then stoned to death. That's nice to think about. She was given the name Joan at some point in the 14th century and her story was widely believed to be true and busts of her likeness were commissioned. The history of the Pope Joan legend is incredibly convoluted there have been so many investigations into whether or not she existed. There are over 500 chronicles of her existence and multiple scholarly books have been written on the subject. Despite there being no undeniable proof of Joan's existence, the story gained significant traction throughout the centuries. It was told as fact by some and debunked as a work of fiction by others. The debate continues to this day. Some people still claim that Joan existed and was a female pope and Others are like absolutely not total work of fiction. Ultimately, I guess it's up to you what you believe in. I'm going to be real with you here. One of my favourite guilty pleasure channels on YouTube is uh, Catfished, if you've ever seen it. Pretty much every week they follow a person who's been duped into sending hundreds of thousands of dollars to the person they've fallen in love with online, only for it to be revealed that the entire thing was a scam. Some of their most popular videos involve people that believe they're in relationships with celebrities. But what happens when the tables turn and the celebrity is the one being catfished? Well, that's exactly what happened to football linebacker Manti Teo in the early 2010s. And it's a story that's told in a two-part Netflix documentary called The Girlfriend Who Didn't Exist. So if you want a more detailed look, then I'd recommend giving that a watch. In late 2012, Manti Teo revealed that both his girlfriend, Lene Kakawa, and his grandmother had died on the same day. His girlfriend had been suffering from leukemia and he'd promised her that if she died, he wouldn't miss a single game, that he would go on playing in her honor. I cried, I yelled. I've never felt that way before. And this is six hours ago, I just found my grandma passed away and you take, you know, the love of my life. Last thing she said to me was, I love you. 
horrific ordeal, and I must stress here that Teo did lose his grandmother and the person that he believed to be his girlfriend. His mourning was completely real. Their relationship had been online and via telephone calls. And for Teo, this was a real relationship and Lene was his girlfriend. But it was soon revealed that Lene didn't actually exist. She was the creation of a person who has since transitioned and now goes by the name Naya. She had used the images of a woman named Diane O'Meara to build this fake profile. The response to this all being revealed in the media was nothing short of disgusting. Here's a man who lost two people, went through a grieving process, only to have it revealed that one of the people he mourned never existed. People couldn't understand why he'd fallen for it, but he explained that they'd had a connection from the very beginning, based on what he believed were mutual interests and similarities. This Lene person, there are so many similarities. She was Polynesian, supposedly. She was Samoan, I'm Samoan. She loved her faith and she knew a lot about, you know, I'm, I'm Mormon and she knew a lot about that. I found a lot of, you know, peace and a lot of comfort in being able to talk to somebody and they knew my standards, they knew my culture, they knew what is expected of me and I know what's expected of her. Obviously, these similarities were carefully engineered by Naya, who had crafted the entire thing as a way to get close to Teo. The humiliation and public ridicule that he suffered as a result of her hoax is so gross and it shows a very limited understanding of the complexities of falling in love online and maybe being a little naive about it. This kind of story happens every single day. It's why that YouTube channel that I recommended at the start has over a thousand videos. Although most of those are usually financial scams and Naya's hoax never appeared to be about money. Instead, she focused on creating an alternate personality for herself, one that she could use to connect with a celebrity. And she seemingly had no regard for how all of this would affect him. And I really do have to hand it to him. Like nearly 10 years later, he has a remarkably positive attitude on the entire ordeal. If, if people didn't find out, if I didn't find out, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't be immovable. Mark Jacob was a pretty unsuccessful day trader. He'd previously lost almost $40,000 in 1998. However, he'd managed to save up again and had borrowed shares in a company called Emulex. In August 2000, he made an incredibly risky decision, selling his 3,000 shares in a short sale. According to an ABC News article, a short sale involves selling borrowed shares of a stock in hopes that the price will decline, enabling an investor to repay the loan at a lower price and keep the difference. Lady Luck was nowhere to be found for Jacob because instead of the stocks falling, they actually rose. And according to news reports, he was now faced with a loss of almost $100,000. I would have packed it up after I'd lost almost 40,000, but that's just me. Jacob had to make a decision, either take the loss or or try and do something about it. Alongside his day trading, he had previously worked at a press release distribution company called Internet Wire, and he soon began to craft his master plan. He devised a fake press release. It claimed that Emulex was being investigated by the SEC, that the company's CEO had resigned, and that the earnings for the preceding quarter would be lower than expected. He fired it off to Internet Wire using a fake name on August 24th, and it was run by several news organisations the next day. And suddenly, Emulex stock didn't look so hot. According to the subsequent litigation release, in the 16-minute period following the republication of the fake press release, 2.3 million shares of Emulex stock were traded and the price plummeted almost $61, from $103.94 to $43, resulting in Emulex losing $2.2 billion in market capitalization. For Jacob, the plan was working perfectly. CNET.com reported that he yielded profits of about 50000 and that he allegedly bought another 3,500 shares of $52 apiece, which he sold three days later for a whopping $186,000. Jacob was caught fairly quickly. He was arrested and sentenced to 44 months in prison. He had about a 
week to spend the cash, so he never really got to enjoy the fruits of his labor. Instead, he was landed with a civil penalty of over $100,000 to pay. In December 1930, newspapers ran an odd story about supposed dissolving bathing suits that had been created in France. Apparently, these were the newest and naughtiest fad of the ultra-smart young set on the Riviera. As soon as they come into contact with water, the bathing suits mysteriously disappear. The article claimed that they were only used for night swimming and that they were made of a tissue that melted with water. The story was revealed to be a hoax by an American journalist named Webb Miller, who wrote in his 1936 memoir that the story had been obtained by a friend of his. Said friend was approached by his editor, who wanted him to send these supposed dissolving bathing suits. Apparently, a manufacturer of bathing suits that advertised in the newspaper wanted to see them. This led his friend to check up on the details of the story, and soon he discovered that there were no dissolvable bathing suits. Instead of admitting that he fell for a hoax, he went back to his editor and said that he couldn't possibly send them because they would dissolve in the sea air. But the editor had a comeback. He asked him to put them in a tin box and have it hermetically sealed. Now, obviously, there's no bathing suits to put in this box in the first place. So his friend puts a couple of handfuls of finely pulverized breakfast food into the box and sends it over to his editor. When his editor opens it up, it looks like the bathing suits have dissolved therefore proving that these highly delicate swimsuits do exist, they just can't be shipped from the France to the USA. And also, he never had to admit to the fact that he fell for a hoax in the first place. And that, my friends, concludes the sixth tier on the hoax's iceberg. The next one will be our grand finale. We'll finally get to discuss some of the weirdest and most obscure hoaxes. And it's going to get a little dark as well, so viewer beware. As always, thanks for watching and a huge thank you to everyone that supports the channel on Patreon. You guys are the absolute best. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. And I will see you in the next one. Bye. Oh, oh.